if we're going to then make a difference in extension systems uh, to improve rural livelihoods, then it must be decentralized, it must be participatory or farm led, and it has to be market driven, at least more market driven. And then we have to look then at, at the, uh, the various resources of the household in terms of the very small, you'll have landless and very small farmers and um, then larger farmers and things like this. And so that affects their land availability, the labor availability, water availability and market access. So why should we get farmers organized into groups? Well, it's fairly clear. This is we're talking about small scale farmers. And it can be done either by extension or by NGOs. In India, it was done primarily by NGOs at first, and then it was taken over by the, <laughs> the groups that were getting organized and operating in separate areas and perhaps interested in different things. And then when research and extension really got into it, first of all, looking at local markets and seeing what the potential was, and then looking at the urban markets, district markets, perhaps even higher up on that, and then starting to get them organized into bigger groups, and then eventually in the global markets. And so like in the case of, uh, of India in one very, very poor district, we had like 35 different types of specialty corns, uh, livestock, I mean the specialty uh, crops, livestock, and, and fisheries going on. And in many cases, like on basmati rice, they were exporting this uh, to Europe and to the United States. And there are a number of other crops that were being exported as well. So you can see that, first of all, you've got to get them organized at the, at the local level and serving local markets and then move up. And as they get organized and get more power, then, of course, they can begin to serve larger markets. And that is particularly important for rural women in terms of they're producing many of these types of crops. The other major issue that I'd like to talk with you about, and one of the other major issues, is financial management. And this is a huge problem after the, in the public extension system after the training and, and visit system was put in place. They put in a lot of additional people, and then when the project ended, they didn't have enough uh, program resources for people to actually deliver services. So when people say, oh, they're just sitting in the office, that's basically true because they don't have any resources for travel and, and program costs and things like this. And the other problem, of course, is top-down management. So the, the people at the national level were setting priorities. And so if we're going to uh, improve uh, uh, real livelihoods, then we have to think about public financing for people at the local level, at the field level, that are working with, um, uh, with the, the farmers themselves. And public financing of extension has really declined, and so that's the reason why public extension is not very effective. On the other hand, it can be scaled up, as shown in, in India. And so once you can get the process going, then all of a sudden uh, extension can be very, very important. But the, the key thing in this case is you've got to listen to farmer groups, and they need the, the uh, program and resources necessary to do this. And so one of the things that we need to learn from the United States and from Europe is that when farmers get organized in groups and then they can start articulating, demanding government resources so that extension has enough resources. And we kind of take that for granted here in the United States. But that, in fact, has to happen, which is why farmers have to, to get involved in the groups. Another important issue is... Um, is natural resource management and the overuse of water. Um, and water is used by about 70% of the water is used. And climate change is becoming a serious problem. And so extension has to address these issues. Public extension does in most cases. And also in terms of when you intensify your uh, cropping systems and things like this, then you start using, uh, you know, uh, too much of the, the fertility in the land, and then you have to develop appropriate land management practices so that the, uh, that <laughs> the crops continue to produce. In many cases, like in sub-Saharan African countries, they don't have enough resources, and therefore this becomes a, uh, a real problem. And uh, the other thing is farmers should use fewer pesticides. I know private sector firms want to to encourage farmers to use more pesticides, but this is an important thing of, 
of uh, integrated pest management and things like this, which we've been talking about for 30, 40 years. But yet again, in many countries, this tends to fall by the wayside if, if public extension isn't advising farmers in this way. In farmer field schools and methodology coming out of Asia, now being used uh, particularly in sub-Saharan African countries, uh, is an effective method for that because it takes a lot of training to, to train farmers how to do this, but it is costly and therefore now it's being used for many different things as just a general extension method. On the other hand, uh, it's probably not sustainable. So in terms of your natural resource management problems, then uh, it's important to train farmers how to use them and if we don't have a public extension system who can do that, then it may be necessary to regulate them, but that's not likely to happen. So I think it's better to educate so farmers really appreciate long-term what's going to happen five years, ten years from now and like this. So just to uh, give you a little bit of an overview of some of the other extension uh, services being provided, I think all of you are familiar with uh, export crops becoming inc increasingly important in, in uh, many of the uh, developing countries, uh, both in Asia, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as in Latin America. And this is producing e export crops that are produced uh, uh, commercially, and you can have tea, coffee, all of these different ones, tobacco, cotton, sugar cane, oil palm, etc. Very, very important. And these are generally handled on a commodity basis by either the export firm or by the farmer groups that are organized to provide these services. And most of them are able to cover the cost of this when they actually sell the exports. And frequently the farmer gets the input from the private sector firm who's, in, who's actually exporting this product. And they give them the, uh, the uh, inputs as well as the advisory services and then what they do is deduct that when they sell the, the product. And so it's a sustainable system and it's uh, expanding and moving forward quite well. The other one I'd like to talk with you about is, is kind of how the role of non-governmental organizations is changing over the past 20 years. Uh, initially they mainly worked on more on the social skills and as well as health care, nutrition and things like this. But as donor resources started coming back uh, into the, uh, in terms of investments in agriculture, we now have a lot of entrepreneurial NGOs uh, who are hiring away, in many cases, uh, some of the best uh, public extension officers uh, because they can double their salary and things like this. And um, so these, these new agricultural NGOs, entrepreneurial NGOs, are very successful in competing for uh, for uh, human resources as well as for donor-driven uh, projects. And so in effect they are now becoming somewhat competitive with, the, with the, uh, the public sector. I think the real issue though is are these sustainable after the donor financing ends? Uh, because in most cases uh, as soon as the project ends then they disappear and things like this. And so that's a, a really important issue that needs to be carefully thought through. Yes they are effective. Are they sustainable? not likely. And the other thing is they are competing between public and NGO resources. And so that is an important issue. The one thing I'd like to talk a little bit about is BRAC, uh, which is a very innovative and sustainable NGO. Started in Bangladesh in, in 72 and is now spreading into other countries. And I find it to be a, a very interesting uh, NGO. The key in this case is it starts with microcredit mainly providing it to women farmers. And it's now operating in Liberia and Sierra Leone and Uganda and Tanzania and as well as in some of the other Asian countries like Pakistan, Afghanistan and Sri Lanka. So what they're doing then is they are essentially, the microcredit is a key part, but then they focus on more uh, high value crops and livestock products. And then they also provide the advisory services to those women farmers. And so in addition to that, they also are working on some of the other things I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation on health care, education, social services. So Brock is a very, very integrated sort of system. The, the main difference between it and other NGOs is that it is sustainable because they're not going after donor resources. They are actually providing services. 
uh, as well as microcredit, and also handling in some cases even the, the inputs that are necessary. Uh, but then farmers pay back the loan so it's a sustainable NGO. And it's a very uh, interesting and uh, innovative uh, NGO that I've never seen before. So let me just kind of conclude then. Um, public extension then I think should move increasingly from heavy emphasis in, on product innovation to process innovation. I think that's where it can really have an impact on real livelihoods. I think it also has to focus on natural resource management. We have climate change, we have overuse of natural resources, and so this is going to have a long-term important problem. And I think that those two issues is where public extension should certainly focus. And therefore, if we're going to make this a sustainable system, institutional changes are necessary, as I mentioned in my presentation. Decentralization, because everything is location specific in terms of the markets, what you can grow and things like this. Farmers have to make the decision, not me as an extension officer, and it has to be market driven. In other words, if I'm five kilometers away, 25 kilometers away, 50 kilometers affects what I can produce and sell. And the other thing I think is very important uh, about public extension systems, they have to become financially sustainable. And again, that goes back to why if farmers start having a say, then they can start articulating to government, hey, we need better resources uh, you know, so that we can be more effective. This has gone on in the United States for many, many years, almost a, ha almost a century. And so we kind of take it for granted. But I think that in terms of in developing countries, it's very important public extension systems have to be financially sustainable. So that is the end of my presentation. And I hope it was useful as you start thinking about innovative extension systems and how we can transform these systems. It is going to be pluralistic, no doubt about it. Private sector will take over more responsibility for input supply, no doubt. And so public extension has to refocus from the T and V days of the 20th century to being much more process innovation focused in the 21st century. Thank you very much.